this video, I thought I would just give a primer on calculating kinetic energy and strain energy for typical structural members. We're going to start off with the kinetic energy, and for the case of a vibrating structure, the kinetic energy T can be written as the integral over the volume of one half rho times the velocity squared, which in vector form can be written as the velocity r dot dotted with itself. So r dot dot r dot dv. And I remind you that putting a dot on top of a variable is the same as taking the time derivative with respect to an inertial reference frame. All right, so let's take a look first as the axial member, which we also call a bar. In that case, the kinetic energy is very simply the integral from zero to L of one half rho times A times U dot squared dx. It's really one half mv squared where rho A is the mass per unit length and we're integrating over the length of the bar. Let's give these some numbers, number one and number two, and put a red box around it. Turning our attention to a flexural member or a beam, we can write the kinetic energy as the volume integral of one half rho times u dot squared plus w dot squared, where u dot is the velocity of the beam in the axial direction, w dot is the velocity in the transverse direction, dv. And let's just draw a simple picture of what we're talking about. We've got a beam and the x-axis with displacement u in that direction, and the z-axis with displacement w in that direction. And if we consider a point, this little black dot, a point on the beam that is a distance z from the neutral axis, if I zoom up on this little piece of the end and consider what happens during a deformation, as the beam rotates upwards, so this point will be displaced backwards. And the amount that it is displaced is equal to the moment arm, z, times the angle, which is theta, or in this case, it's just w comma x, the slope of the beam. So, for the case of small displacements, as we're assuming here, the displacement u is simply w comma x times z, and it's in the minus x direction. So u is equal to the negative of w comma x times z, and a reminder that this is for small displacements. Let's call these number three and number four. Okay, and then we can substitute this expression for velocity into here. So that's substituting equation four into equation three, and that gives us that t is equal to the integral over the volume of one half rho times z squared w comma x dot squared plus w dot squared dv. And that can be rewritten as, we'll split the volume integral as the integral from zero to L, integral over the area of one half rho times, and then I'm just switching the order of this, w dot squared plus z squared w comma x dot squared dA dx. And so performing the integration, first of all, over the area, uh, I'm going to separate it into two terms. The kinetic energy is equal to the integral from zero to L of one half rho times the integral over A dA is just the area times W dot squared dx. Plus the second term is the integral from zero to L of one half rho times, and then the integral of the area of Z squared dA is just I, the second moment of inertia times w comma x dot squared dx, where i squared is the integral over the area of z squared dA and is the second moment of area. Call this number five and six and a big red box around it. Now this first term on the right is called the translational kinetic energy and the second term on the right is the rotational kinetic energy. And in the event of making the Euler Bernoulli beam assumption, the rotational kinetic energy is actually negligible compared to the translational kinetic energy. So that can be ignored with the Euler-Bernoulli assumption. And then finally, let's look at a torsional member or a shaft. Draw a little cutaway drawing here of the endpoint of a circular shaft. And let's draw the cross-sectional view of that. We've got the z-axis pointing up. The displacements are w in that direction. And then based on our choice of coordinates, the y-axis will be pointing to the left and the displacement is v. Now, if we consider a mass on the cross-section, that is a distance r from the origin, so the kinetic energy can be written T is equal to the integral over the volume of one half times rho V dot squared, where V dot is the tangential velocity of the mass, times dV, and that is equal to, I can break down this volume integral into an integral over the area and the length, so one half the integral over A, the integral from zero to L, rho, 
and then the tangential velocity is just r theta dot. So r squared theta dot squared dx dA. This implies that t is equal to the integral from 0 to L of 1 half rho times j times theta dot squared dx. And a reminder that j is just the integral of the area of r squared dA, and it's known as the polar moment of area. Put a box around it, and let's give these some numbers. Number 7 and 8. Okay, and that's all we're going to do for now on the kinetic energy side of things. And we're going to move our attention for now to strain energy. And having a look at the strain energy for these typical structural members, we can write that the strain energy U is equal to the integral over the volume of U0, the strain energy density dV. And that's equal to the integral over the volume of the integral from 0 to Eij of sigma Ij deij dV. And we can apply Hooke's law for linear elastic materials. It's that sigma is equal to E times epsilon. Let's give these numbers, 8 and 9. And now let's turn our attention again to the axial member, the bar. Let me draw a picture here of a uniform bar. Assume that it has stiffness Ea. The axial direction is in the x direction, and the displacements in that direction are u. And we'll assume the length is L. And then we'll put a tensile load at each end. We'll call P. Now, in the case of a bar under tensile load, there is only one component of stress, that's sigma 1, 1. And sigma 1, 1 is simply P divided by the cross-sectional area A. In this case, U can be written as the integral from 0 to L of the strain energy per unit length, which is the integral from 0 to epsilon 1, 1 of sigma 1, 1 d epsilon 1, 1 times A dx. We'll call that 10. And that can be rewritten as the integral from 0 to L and by substituting Hooke's law in here, we can then integrate to find that the integral is 1 half times e times epsilon 1, 1 squared a dx. And this allows us to write u in terms of the displacement as u equals 1 half the integral from 0 to l of e a u comma x squared dx, where u comma x is just the normal strain. Put a box around that. Okay, this can also be written in another usable form, and that is the integral from 0 to L, if we want to write it now in terms of the stresses instead of the strains, uh, 1 over 2e times sigma 1, 1 squared a dx. That is equal to 1 half the integral from 0 to L of p squared divided by e a dx. And that can be very simply integrated to give us u is equal to 1 half p squared L divided by e a put a box around that. This is an alternate form that you'll use for some equations, but primarily we'll use this first form of it. Number 11 and 12. So turning the page and turning our attention to the flexural member or a beam, the strain energy of a beam can be written as u equals the integral over the volume, the integral over the strains of sigma 1 1 d epsilon 1 1 plus sigma 1 2 d epsilon 1 2 dv. This is because the only stresses that survive are the normal stresses in the axial direction, sigma 1, 1, and also the shear stresses, sigma 1, 2. Let's give this a number, number 13, and then that can be rewritten as the volume integral of sigma 1, 1 squared divided by 2e plus sigma 1, 2 squared divided by 2g dv. And all I've done here, I actually skipped a step. I used Hooke's law to write this in terms of the stresses, and what I did here is I skipped a step, I actually integrated over the strains, and that gives me the volume integral of sigma 1, 1 squared divided by 2e plus sigma 1, 2 squared divided by 2g dv. Let's draw a little diagram of what we're talking about. We have a flexural member. It has a cross section with height h and width b. And from elementary beam analysis, we know that sigma 1, 1, the normal stresses, is equal to minus mz divided by i, where m is the applied moment. And then also sigma 1, 2 is equal to v times q divided by ib, where v is the shear force, q is the first moment of area, and i is the second moment of area. This can be rewritten as the volume integral of, and then substituting sigma 1, 1 and sigma 1, 2 into here, I can get m squared z squared divided by 2ei squared plus v squared q squared divided by 2gi squared b squared. And therefore u can be rewritten as the integral from 0 to l, and I've gone ahead and integrated over the area, this z squared gives me an i in the numerator, so as a result I'm left with m squared divided by 2ei, one of the i's in the denominator cancelled, dx, 
plus the integral over the area of q squared divided by b squared dA, since none of these are a function of x, times the integral from 0 to L of v squared divided by 2gi squared dx. And I'll remind you from elementary beam theory, we know that the moment m is equal to ei w comma xx squared, where w comma xx is the curvature. Now this first term on the right is the bending strain energy, and the second term on the right is the shear strain energy. And for the case of an Euler-Bernoulli beam for slender beams, the shear strain energy can be ignored. Turns out the shear strain energy becomes important for shorter, stubbier beams, and it's also important for beams made out of anisotropic materials, such as composites or wood. So I can neglect the second term on the right-hand side, and then finally I can rewrite U, the strain energy of the beam, as substituting this in for M, is one half the integral from zero to L of EI W comma XX squared DX. We call this number 14, and this is the strain energy expression for a beam. We put a box around it. Okay, and then finally turning our attention to the torsional member or shaft, we can write the strain energy U as the integral over the volume of one half sigma X theta gamma x theta, where sigma x theta and gamma x theta are the shear stresses and strains respectively, dV. And that's, I think we're up to number 15. This can be rewritten as one half times the volume integral of, and then using Hooke's law, we can write this as g gamma x theta squared, dV. And let's just draw a quick diagram here. We've got a shaft with a circular cross section, and it's being twisted by some angle theta. And we know from elementary analysis that the shear strain gamma x theta is equal to r d theta dx or r theta comma x. So this is equal to one half times the integral from zero to L of g times the integral over a of r squared theta comma x squared, where I've just made the substitution. And I'm missing a dA and dx. And so we can write u as the integral from zero to L of one half gj times theta comma x squared dx. Sometimes it's convenient to write this instead in terms of the external moment. We can also write this as u equals one half of the integral from zero to L of m sub t squared divided by gj dx, where m sub t is the applied external moment. Let's number these 16 and 17 and put a box around each and we are done. That's all I'm going to say about this video. I hope you found something useful in it. If you did, please help me out and smash those like buttons so others can get to view this too. If you have any questions or comments for me, I'd love to hear about them in the comment section below. If you'd like to be notified of future video releases, please hit the subscribe button and click on those bells. And finally, I remind you that if anyone wants a copy of these lecture notes, they are available for download using the link in the description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch up with you in the next video.